Today I'm going to talk about Bayesian computational analysis of cell division dynamics. It's a work that we are doing with uh, mathematicians and uh, cell biologists. So I've tried to be quite in the middle uh, and try to give the high level ideas of our project. So um, some preliminaries uh, about cell division. So we all come from a single cell and by the time we are adults we have like 30 trillion cells. And this happens, of course, with the cell division. Um, how does that happen? Well, cell, cell division is consisted of various phases. I'm showing only three, three of them. It's prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, and the last one is telophase. In essence, the cell needs to accurately replicate its chromosome. You can see it here with this uh, X. This is one um, uh, chromosome. And uh, they need to replicate the chromosomes. They have, we have two sisters of chromatids. So what do you mean by that? You see that X, but uh, the two strands of the X is one sister chromatids. Basically, they have the same uh, genetic material and uh, these sister chromatids, uh, they will uh, end up in two different cells. So the chromosomes need to segregate with high fidelity. And uh, this happens as follows. So we have the cell, the two poles are um, uh, are going to the opposite sides of the cell. Then from the two poles, some strings that we call the microtubules, they start to emerge from the cell, uh, from the poles, I'm sorry. And uh, at some point, they, we have some bundles of these microtubules, which we call them K-fibers. And these uh, K-fibers go and attach on the uh, chromosomes. At some point, all the K-fibers connect to all the uh, chromosomes. The chromosome starts to align to a metaphase plate. It's an imaginary plane that uh, we're calling it metaphase plate. And uh, at, the, at that time, the K fibers start to polymerize and depolymerize by the mean that they start to increase and decrease their length. They start to move to oscillate around this metaphase plate. And at some point, more forces are applied and they start to segregate, move away from each other, and then we have two cells. So it's very important to have a, an extremely or an ex extraordinary precise uh, process, but unfortunately this process is error prone. It's well stated that it's error prone and by mean, uh, we mean that we, have, we might have misattachments what does that mean? It means that the sisters, these two uh, pairs, they might be correctly, uh, they might not be correctly attached to the two poles. So uh, the result of that might be to have the both sisters ending in one cell and the other cell doesn't have any of these sisters. So in essence, we will be ending up with uh, two cells with a different number of chromosomes. This is uh, a phenomenon that we call it an eploidy and it's a hallmark of cancer. So it's important to understand how cell division works. We are focusing in, uh, on metaphase in our work. So let's dive a bit deeper. So we have the two poles of the cell, the centrosomes. Uh, from the centrosomes, we have the microtubules, the, the strings that we set. After some time, they start to create bundles of microtubules. We have the K-fibers. The K-fibers go and attach on the chromosomes. They attach on these red dots here, which are uh, the protein machineries that are responsible, basically, or at least what we know of, of the uh, cell division. And we call them kinetochores. So the K-fibers start to increase and decrease their length, and they make them move around the metaphase plates. They make, make, they make them to oscillate. So these are the, uh, uh, one example of our real data. And you see the two sisters oscillating. This is a metaphase, right? And here they start to move away from each other. So we have the anaphase. They move away from each other and then we will create the two cells. Okay, I hope you're all with me. So let's see how our data now look like. We have human RP1 cell line movies. We have um, 3D high resolution tracking of sister chromatids through the whole cell division. Uh, it's a pretty cool look thing. So we, we actually paint some uh, proteins inside the cell 
and we can, uh, uh, sorry, uh, we have some fluorophores that are paints. We, pro uh, we paint the, uh, the proteins and we can watch them. So let's see an example of what our, our data look like. So um, we take pictures every two seconds. You can see them oscillating around the metaphase, imaginary metaphase plate, and we can see them uh, then dividing. Another thing, another video here, we can see a bit of their tra trajectories. The history of trajectories is very cool. The metaphase now, the metaphase plate now is um, vertical. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to see that every time. <laughs> so, um, so uh, we need to model this procedure and we need to understand what are the mechanics of this. So. Let's imagine that we have the cell over here. I'm sorry, I'm using the mouse pad. It's a bit more easier for me. And let's think now that we have only one chromosome and we reverse the cell. So we have the two poles, okay? So what are the forces that are applied in each chromosome? In each uh, chromosome, yeah. So we have, let's say that this is one sister chromatid and it's the kinetochore, the protein that is, att is attached on one sister and the other one. So in the, in the chromatids, we have a force that is applied from the, uh, let's try to use that, from the, uh, from the uh, uh, K fibers, the strings that we said before. We have the polar ejection force, which is a force that is applied from the poles to make the chromosomes move away from the poles. We have another force that is caused by the spring that is attaching, it's binding the two chromosomes. So in order to the chromosomes, the chromatids to be together, they need to have some a, a kind of attachment. So they have a string between of them, which is uh, elastic. And, and so we have to take into account this force and the drag force as uh, known from physics. So, so we have, a, this is an actual real photo. We, we had painted the cell with three different uh, colors. You can see the blue one is the chromosomes, uh, is the DNA. The green one is the microtubules, the strings, which will uh, uh, create the K fibers. And the red spots are the kinetochores. We can see the attachments. We know that they, are, they are exist there, but we can see them in much detail. We can't do that. So we use a, a reverse engineering and data-driven data approach to fit complex mechanistics models, and you, we use a, a Bayesian methodology to make inference on that. So we need to uh, answer, uh, we want to answer three questions. The first two questions will be uh, in one uh, model that I will show next, and the third one will be in the second model that I will be presenting. So we need to answer how do sister pair kinetochores behave? We need to answer, um, we want to find answers. So about if the dynamics that are driven by these attachments we talked before. Uh, are they symmetric for both sisters? Are, are they the same when they are applied to both sisters? And we are asking ourselves if there's another force uh, that um, contributes to the pair of kinetochores, uh, if the sisters are not aligned. So I, we said that they are on, on one plane. If they are not in the same plane, let's say that one sister is like that. Is there a, another force, a torque, that makes them twist them back to come back to the collinearity. So um, let's see the first two questions. The first model is about the K-fiber attachments. What do we mean by that? The first one is the correct attachment. So each sister chromatid has the same number of, of microtubules, of strings attached on it, so in essence, we have symmetric force attached on it, right? But if this happens, we have uh, many types of uh, misattachments. All of these are misattachments. If, for example, the number seven misattachment, the merotelic attachment happens, so you can see that we have one string over here and two more on the other pole. So this sister has um, attachments in both poles, okay? So that means that the, the forces are not symmetric, and then we expect the velocity of one sister, this velocity moving away or moving towards the pole, and the velocity moving away or moving towards the pole of the other sister to be different. So if we find that this happens, then we have a very strong hint that 
we have misattachments. We cannot see them, but we, have, we can uh, detect, uh, the, we can understand that this exists. So this is our model. We have two standard dif uh, differential equations. We work only with the x-axis over here. So this is the force that is, attached, that is uh, caused by the string. This is the length of the string, the uh, constant, the, contest, uh, the spring constant, and this cosine theta comes from this fact over here. Uh, if the sisters are not like this, but they are like this, there is a, an angle, and this um, is, um, it makes a difference on the length of the spring and on the force that is applied from the string. This is the uh, polar ejection force. This is the error term. We assume Gaussian errors. And these are the velocities that are uh, are that are um, the velocities basically are are caused by the attachments that are at, are at, uh, around the um, chromosomes. So we have two standard differential equations, but they are under a hidden Markov setting. So what do we mean in what uh, do do the hidden states mean? They actually have a biophysical interpretation now. So if the sister is moving away from the pole, that is a plus state. And if the sister is moving towards the pole, that is a minus state. The same applies for the other one. Away is a plus, towards the pole is a minus. So if we combine this, um, these states, we end up with a hidden Markov model with four different hidden states. So in essence, they are doing this movement. Both sisters might end up doing like that. This is a minus plus state, or they are kind of doing like that, plus minus state. Or because we said that there is a string between of them, they might do like that. So it's a minus minus state, or they might do push towards each other. This is a plus plus state. So this is our model. We discretize these two SDEs with the euler maruyama uh, approximation. We make inference via a Hamiltonian hidden Markov model using STAN. And we compare five different models via base factors. What do we mean by five different models? You see these red uh, parameters over here. So these are the parameters that we uh, allow to be different. So we allow for the, um, si the, the velocity that one sister, the sister one moves away from the pole to be different from, for the other, uh, than the velocity that the second sister moves away from the pole. This is in the idea that we might have misattachments. We have merotelic, for example, attachments, as we saw before. We expect that if we have the wrong attachments, these velocities might be different. So we might have different, uh, dif different velocity towards the poles, away from the poles, a combination of the two, or different errors, error um, uh, standard deviations. Okay, so in essence, we end up with uh, five different models and we compare them. If we have strong indications that they have some kind of asymmetry, then we, um, we say that this pair, this particular pair is asymmetric. And surprisingly, we found that 20% of the pairs are uh, asymmetric. They have different velocities. And we have a very strong hit that we have for this 20% of the pairs and uh, a misattachment, a merotelic, as we call it, attachment, so they don't they are not correctly attached. So this is a very nice result and we want, it helps us understand the structure and the, how this procedure works, but then we want to see if we can correlate this result with another uh, result that was in 2021 in Senegal. Do us this asymmetry predict lazy kinetic cores? What do we mean by lazy kinetic cores? So we mean that they are lagging behind. The, the most easy way to understand this, if you see this picture, please focus on the red dots. You see this kinetic cores, they lag behind and they are not going with their cluster. Some, so the, we call this kinetic cores lazy. We want to understand if the asymmetry is correlated with the lazy ones. And if they are lazy enough, we are thinking that they will not uh, go to the correct cluster at some point. So the, the cell will um, divide, divide before they go to their correct cluster. And we will expect to have an exploity, wrong number of 
chromosomes within the cells. So this is our first model. Yeah, thank you. I hope you are all with me. So then we thought, yes, but we have the we have like x, y, and z axis. Why use only the x axis? So we want to answer, as I said before, if there is any torque, if there is another force in in a, in a, uh, that drives these movements. So let's think that we have the sisters like that but instead of being in the same plane, they are like that. So we are thinking, is there any, are there any other forces, you can see over there here, that drives them to come back to collinearity, so the process will be easier and uh, maybe more correctly attached. So after many more, many maths and physics, which I don't really understand, Nigel did that, uh, my supervisor, we ended up with these three equations, we now have information from the three dimensions and, and uh, surprisingly this model is indeed inferable. Again we discretize, we make inference with the uh, Markov chain, uh, uh, Hamiltonian Markov chain. We found out that the common parameters as we had before in the uh, 1D model, for example, uh, the velocities or the spring constant over here, they are the same, so they are consistent. And we found out that they, not all of sister pairs have this torque, but some of them. So we want to understand now, is this some of them correlated with the asymmetry that we found before and the laziness? So this is our way of, of working towards that. And uh, yeah, this is my talk. This is the end of the talk. Um, I would like to acknowledge the people in uh, SC, uh, MSCB in uh, Warwick, especially Andrew and Alessio, who provide the data and the intuition, and Nigel, my supervisor, and Abdullah with the software that he um, uh, that he helps us in kinetic of core tracking. By the way, if someone is using, if, if someone is working on the kinetic of course and on the cell biology, we have created a very nice um, package, a software, MATLAB software package that you can use to uh, help with the data uh, processing and kinetic of course tracking. So uh, yes, thank you very much for your attention. I think I was talking a bit faster than I used to rehearse myself. Yeah, yeah okay. I'm sorry about that. No, thank you for the talk. Very, very, uh, very clear. Um, do we have any questions? Yes. Yep. I actually have two. So the first one is, uh, can you go back to the one-dimensional model? Yes. So the theta t parameter that you put there, shouldn't it be related to the x in some way? Because so if it is the orientation when you move the x. Yes, it's, it's related to the x. This is how we derive it, basically. We are using the x dimension to find out the, the angle between the two sisters, yes. Ah, okay, okay. So it contains the x variables. Yes, exactly. Okay, and the second question is still on this on this uh, stochastic differential equation. You just added um, additive noise, right, to that. Mm -hmm. um, Normal noise. Do you have any, yeah, maybe it's okay, I don't know. Uh, is there any model checking? Uh, so do, do you think that the, the noise model is the correct one or you could update or improving it could be helpful? You mean by changing the distribution or something? Yeah, I mean that, uh, okay, what I mean, is I, uh, yeah. maybe takes a bit longer, but, uh, is that the uh, ODE can be seen as a chemical reaction network. Okay. And uh, if you take the, uh, so the limit of a chemical reaction network, if you take a, 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 a Markov chain that converges to, a, to, a, to an ODE, if you take the diffusion approximation of that, Mark, uh, of that Markov chain model, you would get a different noise, which contains the X variables as well. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that would be anyhow helpful or not, because maybe the noise is not very important in the system, I don't know. But 
We, we have tried to work with some diffusion models. Uh, we found that this one fits the data uh, better. Yeah, we've tried the diffusion models, but this, is, this one is working better. And especially with the uh, more complex 3D model, we have now even uh, uh, less error terms. Uh, I mean, uh, closer um, distribution, posterior distribution. So uh, we think that this currently <laughs> fits our needs. Thank you. Uh, thank you too. Okay, any, any other questions? Yeah. Oh, very nice talk, thank, thank you. you. Um, I just wanted, so this is just a point of clarification, I may have missed this, but I, the bit in the middle between the nodes um, is modeled as a spring. Uh, are the strings that pull them apart and in modeled as string, do they have elasticity? Is that taken into account or? In essence, what happens, uh, sorry, here. So uh, you mean, but these, these strings, right? Yes. Uh, as the time passes, the, these strings are increasing or decreasing their length. Mm -hmm. So there is a force that is continuously applied on them. So in order to take into account this increasing and decreasing of the length, we have the hidden states in essence. So um, that's why you are using, we are using the plus and the minus state uh, to take into account they might be increasing or decreasing their length. Is this the question if I understood? Yeah, so in, in essence, in a way they are being modeled as string, but you're incorporating that in the hidden states rather yes. than directly in the model. Yes, yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you too. In essence, sorry, as a follow-up, um, we have, this is the model that uh, explains the, the displacements between the two sisters, okay? So if the sisters are moving like that, uh, this string will be uh, consequently increasing the length. So this is how we take it into account, not directly as a continuous mm -hmm. uh, variable. Thank you. Thank you too. Okay, any other questions? So I guess I'll jump in with a, a quick one at this point then. Um, so this spring that you're using to model this, this interaction um, is just a sort of linear spring model. Uh, have you investigated other potential sort of potential models for, for how these things uh, interact with each other? The, the string between of them? Mm. Um, no, no. We, we are thinking of it as a string and the most obvious way to do it is to if the string increases their length or decreases its length and how if you may like if you if you think of a, of a, um, a spring that is very hard so there is more force that needs to apply it or is very loose so this is why we have the k the the, the spring length and the uh, angle between of them so it's a standard model for modeling the springs but we might have I don't know some other string there is one other thing that we have as a limitation in our model you can see that these the K fibers over here are are, are, are not exactly um, lines but they are like that so our next step is to try to fit an arc instead of a line between the, uh, between the uh, chromosomes. So maybe this arc will also have an effect on the spring. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay, and uh, any, any more questions? No, brilliant. Well, in that case, uh, let's thank Constantina once again. Thank you. Sir.